Hello and welcome to the Jazz Jam Podcast. I'm your host, Dwayne Gunnels, joined by my co-host, Max Levy. On today's episode, we're going to be getting into a very, very newly released album entitled New Standards Volume 1 by Terry Lynn Carrington, a a jazz drummer that's been on the the scene for quite some time. Um, But before we get into the episode today, we're going to get into our weekly jazz question of the week that we like to do and we're going to take it in a little bit different direction this week uh the jazz question of the week this week max is what is your current gear setup and are you fully satisfied with it slash what changes would you make to that and we can both answer this so i'll let you go first max wow that is a very i don't know pointed question that could go a lot of different directions i think a lot of players are more gear heads than me I'm not a big gearhead, but I will say, you know, I've been playing on a Cannonball tenor saxophone for almost 10 years now, and I love the sound I get with it. I get more of a, a deep, uh, huskier tone, and my mouthpiece is a um, made by a guy named John Thomas, so he makes custom hard rubber mouthpieces. I think he's in Florida, and so uh, I use that hard rubber John Thomas with D'Addario jazz select uh reads which used to be rico jazz select and so that's my current setup and i use francois louis ligatures um on the mouthpiece that hold the read to the mouthpiece and so i i love the basic francois louis ligature um it just seems to be a little more free blowing and i just love the the sort of fuller deeper sound i get and i used to play on a auto link metal mouthpiece but i feel like i get more flexibility from the hard rubber and it just seems to to fit what i want to do with my sound in the right direction and i would love to try out a number of vintage horns something like a king super 20 or a selmer super balanced action or a balanced action i think i think those would be horns i would want to try out um i have played a busher aristocrat very recently and i almost got this you know the same type of sound that i'm getting on my cannonball which i cannot say for some other horns i've tried i've tried a number of selmer mark sixes and they honestly didn't really do it for me in terms of the the type of sound i i wanted to get out of the horn i i seem to have more success with the busher and and maybe some of these other vintage horns i would want to try out um and right now the cannonball is working fine with me i make sure you know, I take it to my guy once a year, if not twice a year, to, to, to keep it in maintenance and, and fix everything that needs fixing. And it's a pro model horn, and it's gotten me through a lot of gigs these past 10 years. And I'm going to stick with it for now and, and maybe try something else later. Yeah, I'm glad that you got into kind of the specifics of why you chose, like, your ligature versus others. I was going to ask that, actually, like, with the sound. Um, one question I have is, would you think about getting different saxophones for different groups or different sounds that you want or are you trying to go for like one specific sound like that's your sound is you know would you think about like oh i've got this saxophone that kind of sounds like this so i'll play it in this situation or is it just i want to sound like this in general in general you want to have one overall sound that you as a player are going for but within that sound, you want to be able to be fle- a little flexible with it so you can manipulate it a little bit in certain musical settings. Um, and that, I think that's on you more of a, of a player than the horn itself. And you kind of want a horn that can be a little flexible. But overall, you know, you should have kind of a, a, a general idea of what your overall sound is what you know wants to be and and that's kind of what you're going for bright versus dark you know hefty versus light um how are you articulating how are how do you sound in the different ranges of the horn there's a lot of things to double check as a player and and really you know make sure you're you're on top of it and and what and making the the right sound you're going for and you know stuff like ligatures Generally speaking, you want the ligature in a jazz or pop setting to have as little touch to the reed as possible so that the reed can vibrate as much as as you want it to. Um, And then usually in classical, it's kind of the opposite where you have more, um, you know, more touch between the ligature and the reed. 
and you kind of want less flexibility in your in your bottom jaw and stuff. And so anyway, those are particular things about your own, your own sound and, and how your setup can help you achieve the sound you want. But in general, you know, if we're just talking fundamentals and the basics, eight times out of 10, it's something you need to work on as a player, not necessarily the horn or the mouthpiece you're using. Yeah, and that's definitely interesting because that's very different for like a woodwind player or a saxophone player versus like me as a keyboard player because there's no like I don't have an individual tone, you know, like the instrument creates the the sound and I can manipulate it and keyboard players are manipulating. We're getting different sounds and organists, you know, with the draw bars, like we're always getting different sounds out of the instrument. So I think that's good. Like that's a good point to make is like you want to have a unique sound, which is very different from like a you know, organists have unique styles and techniques, but we don't have our Lit, like our own unique sound i mean unless we're playing a different kind of organ which is they're all going to sound the same a hammond's going to sound like a hammond b3 you know the nord c2d is going to sound like that um so i think that's a good point and i think one thing that um you pointed out is maybe in a classical setting you would like pretty much for all like pop jazz that kind of stuff you're going to keep the same setup because that's that sound but in a classical setting maybe you would change up your your um gear a little bit yeah, generally you do have a different mouthpiece in a classical setting than you would a jazz or pop setting and different reeds. You know, the classic classical jazz or sorry, uh, saxophone reed is the Van Doren Blue Box. And that's a great go to for anything classical. And then there's Van Doren Red Green boxes. And of course, the jazz select reeds are, are like are you know, what I like to use. So you're right. The the mouthpiece and the ligature setup and the reed would be different in both scenarios. Um, and sometimes the horn could be different or usually not, but at least the mouthpiece is different. Cool. I think that's an interesting uh, um, thing to point out. So let's get into my, my setup a little bit, what I currently have. And maybe, is there anything that you would want you just said you just some different like trying out some different uh older horns yeah there's just a number of horns i haven't really tried out um and i'm not as much enamored with gear as other players <laughs> so i just haven't um you're happy with what you got I, i'm happy with what i got for now and there's just a, s some specific horns i would like to try out at some point and it's not necessarily a selmer mark six so which is like kind of the go-to is a very common go-to, but the ones I've tried, I, I didn't really care for that much. They felt great, um, but I got more of my sound from other horns. Yeah, that's cool. That's interesting to, to point out. Cool, yeah. Well, my setup, what I currently have is um, I have the Hammond SK2, which, if you don't know, is just the um, an electronic Hammond B3, or it's just a Hammond emulator. You can get the B3, the A2. You can get any really like most um, Hammond organ sounds out of it. They're programmed in there. You can you know manipulate it like your typical Hammond organ. It's got two. It's got one set of draw bars, not two like the Nord C2D does. Um, but you can change. There's a button for upper and lower draw bars that so you just click that button, and then that set of draw bars is controlling the upper or the lower draw bars which I'm super happy with. I love the Hammond sound. The C2D also sounds great. It sounds a little bit more crunchy and modern, I want to say. Um, but it, it also has a very great sound. It can have kind of a darker sound to it. Um, some guys will use it for like some different like non-jazz musicians will use the C2D over like a Hammond because it can you can kind of get like a more progressive rock sound out of it at times or like a darker sound to it, which is cool. Um, but it also works great for jazz. Corey Henry... Um, he was playing one a lot, but I think he's playing just a Hammond B3 that he lugs around now for the most part. Um, so I'm super happy with that. I don't think I'd change that. I definitely like the C2D as well. They're kind of, you know, either this preference. Um, but then as most of a lot of like uh, modern organists, I have a synthesizer. I have the Yamaha MK49, which is just like a it's like a baby motif. It's one of Yamaha's like smaller workstations. For me, it works great. It, it's fairly affordable. If you're looking for like a workstation or a synthesizer with a lot of good sounds, it's got pretty much um, a lot of the motif sounds, your electric piano sounds, any string sounds, um, different piano sounds that you need. So it's definitely a good budget uh, synthesizer if you're looking for one. But if I were to be able to I wouldn't change my SK2. I, I think I'm keeping that. But if I had an unlimited budget, I think I would go with something more like um, 
a Nord, uh, one of their synthesizers or workstations, just because they, the sounds on those, or Yamaha has really good sounds, but I just, some of the Nords, I like the way that the Nord sounds and their electric piano sounds on Nords are, are really good. So I think if I could, I might go, or Korg. There are so many good options as far as synthesizers. It's like there's millions, it feels like millions of synthesizers. So, you know, take your pick. They A lot of them sound great. Um, for me personally, I think I would upgrade um, to another synthesizer. But yeah, I've got, you know, the MX-49 uh, works great. So I'm, I'm digging that. And another thing is I if I could, I would add in a synthesizer um, like a Moog uh, Sub-37 for bass and synth stuff. I see a lot of cats use the Nord, you know, with the red yeah top. although ham and sk2 you get the red it's a darker red yeah but, yeah it's um, like a wooden yeah yeah but i see a lot of cats use the nords um so yeah i don't blame you but they are pretty pricey they are definitely pricey you can find used ones that are more affordable but they're pricey for a reason they're really well made um keyboards so yeah but yeah and so kind of like it's kind of a more typical like current like if you'll get cory henry set up that's kind of a a more modern like jazz organist setup is to have your organ, your keyboard, like your synthesizer, like workstation and a synth as well. So it you could just get a lot of a lot of stuff out of that. You want to be surrounded by as many instruments as humanly possible. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> as close to Herbie Hancock as you can get. Like give me like twenty <laughs> keyboards and give me like a a a, a throne that I can just spin 360 around in. There's like an, what album cover? Do you know what album cover that is where he's surrounded by like a bajillion keyboards? I have seen it quite it's a like few times. It's like red. Oh yeah. my God. Um, We'll update on the next episode. I'll look into that. <laughs> um, But cool. Well, let's get into, um. that was a good, I like that conversation. If anyone wants to send us their pics of their gear, like what they're rocking with, um, please like, uh, Post it on Instagram and tag us in it, and we'll repost it to our Instagram. It's the Jazz Jam Podcast on Instagram. We'd love to see your setup and what you're working with. So, yeah, that's awesome. Let's get into the this album itself, um, New Standards Volume 1. I'm going to get into a bit of the history, and then I'll let Max get into the personnel on the album. So this album is released on Candid Record Label, and it was just released in September. I said it was super recent. It was just released in September of this year. And so um, a little bit about Candid Records is it was started in 1960 uh, by band leader and arranger Archie Blyer. And it was started as an offshoot of his pop label, Candence Records. Um, and so it was big in the in 1960 to 1961 and then kind of dried up. And then the catalog was bought by Andy Williams in 1964 and laid dormant for a while until it was bought by Alan Bates in 1980 who brought the label back into action and signed greats like Kenny Barron and then sold the label to Glenn Barrows in 2019. And it remains a steady record label for um, seasoned and new artists. I mean, Terry Lynn Carrington's been a- around for a while, so she's played with many greats. So she's kind of a, a veteran musician that's um, on Candid Records. Yeah, it's uh, one of those labels you'll you'll see around, and it's got a, a long history with it, both being active and inactive. And you're right, Terry Lynn Carrington has been been around a while, but she's doing a lot of great new things. And this is one output of of one of the, you know, sort of um, actions that Carrington is doing. She she's somewhat of an activist in in what she does. I believe she leads the jazz and gender justice sort of committee or department. Um, I'm not exactly sure how to call it, but anyway, she, she's very proactive in, in recognizing the lack of, of women representation in certain aspects of jazz and the arts. And so this album is basically her reaction to that. She noticed that there were not many tunes in the real book that, were written by female composers or at least were credited to female composers. And she created a new standards book for Hal Leonard that included 101 songs solely written by women. And this record is a recording of 11 of those. And all in all, she hopes to record versions of all 100 and songs that are included in her new standards book. Um, And, and this is just the first iteration of that. 
the main core of the band on New Standards Volume 1 is Terry Lynn Carrington on drums. You got Chris Davis on piano, Linda May Han O oh on bass, Nick Payton on trumpet, Nicholas Payton, and the great Matt Stevens on guitar. And there are many, many guests throughout the album. And we'll discuss them as we go on to discuss each track that they're on and briefly mention some of their backgrounds. Um, it's just too much to do all at once. Yeah, for sure. Um, there's definitely a lot of up and coming and some more seasoned musicians on this album. So it's cool to get kind of a look and there's some uh, musicians that we've had before on the podcast. So it'll be cool to get in. Max, why don't you tell us a little bit about each one of the, of these musicians, the main band on the, on the album. Yeah. So of course, the leader on the set is Terry Lynn Carrington, drummer, composer, educator, born in August 1965 to a very musical family. Her father, Solomon Matthew Carrington III, um, is or, or was a, a professional saxophone player. And because of that, she was surrounded by the music early on. She received her first drums at age seven that originally belonged to her grandfather, who passed away six months before she was even born. And if you don't know, her grandfather was Solomon Carrington Jr., who was a drummer that played with many cats, including the great Fats Waller. And an interesting story, apparently he died on a gig right after finishing that gig with Gene Ammons as he was walking to a table in the venue where his son, Terry's dad, was sitting inside the club waiting, you know, to, to greet Solomon, um, uh, sorry, not so yeah, Solomon, her grandfather. So it's just a very interesting story. And he sort of just collapsed on his way to the table right after finishing that gig with Gene Ammons. Um, so I'm saying playing with Gene Ammons will do it to you. <laughs> that, that swing was too hard to handle. Yeah. I don't know. Uh, interesting story there, but by the age of 11, she was playing drums very proficiently and she had a gig with clark terry at age 11 and then soon went on to study at berkeley college of music with um you know studying with greats like greg osby and alan dawson she was also mentored by jack DeJanet, and then moved to new york where she played with cats like stan getz pharaoh sanders dave sanborn cassandra wilson and many others and she was the house drummer for the arsenio hall show she would go on to tour with Herbie Hancock from 97 to 2007, and she's recorded both as a band leader and as a side woman. She's won three Grammy Awards, including Best Jazz Instrumental Album with her work Money Jungle, Provocative and Blue, that was an homage to the classic Duke Mingus and Max Roach record Money Jungle. And she was the first woman to receive that Grammy category. She continues to record and perform with a host of top musicians around the world. So you'll see her name quite a bit, especially lately. She's been very active. Yeah, and she's probably one of the most like veteran like jazz drummers we have still in the music today. She's been around for so long. She's played with so many people. She's been playing since she was 11. Um yeah, and uh, one thing I want to point out is that um, you mentioned Jack DeJanet, but he had a really big influence on her and really, really um, took her under his wing, and they have a, a really, really tight relationship from from what I've I've read. So he's a, a really cool. He plays, um, he does uh, drums and, and tap dancing. Um, who's the guy who does tap dancing? You know, Are you thinking about Maurice and Gregory Hines? Is that what it is? Jack DeJanet does drumming for i'm gonna have to look it up hold on i don't <laughs> well want... it, it could be quite a few different guys but you're right jack t Jeanette is is one of the masters of jazz drum set and has been a huge influence on terry lynn carrington and i also see her name quite a bit associated with the likes of christian mcbride um so that's another i don't know influence or or sort of band leader that that she's known for um, playing with so she's just all around you'll you'll see your name everywhere and jack dejanet is just a, a master of what he does i'm not exactly sure um what you're referring to there, did you find it yeah there was a tour that jack dejanet did with a tap dancer i'm gonna find it out um i'm guessing you're thinking of maurice or gregory hines who were brothers and i i don't uh, I'm not sure if there's, I think Maurice is still alive. Um, 
Why but you could be think you could be thinking of somebody newer than that. Um, I could be wrong. I don't know. Get into the next um, person, and I'll keep I'll keep looking, and I'll tell you. Yes, because I, I, I would be interested to know. Um, but going on with the personnel on the album, we got Chris Davis, pianist, Canadian jazz pianist, born in Vancouver in 1980. Chris started studying classic piano, classical piano, by age six. They were steeped in the jazz tradition by high school. By eighth grade, she knew she wanted to be a jazz musician. Chris would go on to attend the University of Toronto, and she's known for some solo piano recordings and as a great composer. She completed her master's at City College of New York, and in 2020, Chris Davis was named Composer of the Year and Pianist of the Year by the Jazz Journalist Association. So that's Chris Davis on piano. We also have a, a woman bassist, Linda May Han O. Oh. She's an Australian jazz bassist and composer born in 1984, and she started clarinet by age 11. Dwayne, what's the update? Did you find out? Yeah, Savion Glover is, uh, they went on tour together. This is what I was thinking. I actually saw them at UNCW, at the, the school I went to. Um, oh, okay. Yeah, a tap dancer, Savion Glover, they teamed up and they did um they like went on tour and it was just just jack jack dejanet and savion glover who's a tap dancer and they did a, a tour together and i think jack dejanet actually does some tap dancing himself i just when i was looking videos of him and roy haynes tap dancing together came up when i was looking it up you're right you're right i've seen those videos of him with roy haynes um so I knew Ooh. there was like a tap dancing connection i but i actually saw jack dejanet and savion glover do a set together with Savion tap dancing and Jack drumming. And it was, it was super cool. Um, so okay. yeah, some jazz tap dancing. All right. I knew there was something there. I was like, I, I might just be talking out of my butt completely, but okay. I'm glad that we, uh, we figured that one out. That was going to rack our brains for the rest of the episode. And we would not be able to, you know, stay on point for the listening audience. So I'm glad we figured that out. Yeah. Let's get back to our regularly <laughs> scheduled program. Let's get, uh, keep going on with these instrumentalists, Max. So talking about bassist Linda, uh, Linda Mahon, oh, again, she started clarinet at age 11, then picked up the bass in high school. She attended the Western Australian Academy of Performing Arts, where she learned upright bass and then completed a master's degree at Manhattan School of Music in 2008. She's since recorded or performed with the likes of Ambrose Ekinmusire, drummer Obed Calvert, alto sax John I Ira Baggin, Ira Baggin. T.S. Monk, Slide Hampton, James Morrison, Dave Douglas, Pat Metheny, and the list goes on and on. So you'll see Linda May Han O's name quite a bit. And I know I read a blurb somewhere where she was influenced by the bass playing of Ray Brown on the album Night Train that we went over. There we go. The connections. Episode. The connections are there. Um, and then a, a really very you know, prominent player in, in the world of jazz today. Nicholas Payton is on trumpet on this album. He was born in New Orleans in 1973 to a musical family. His father was a bassist and a tuba player named Walter Payton. And he began playing trumpet by age four and was sitting in with cats by the age of nine. So Nicholas Payton was already playing the gigs. Um, and what grade? Third grade? Fourth grade? That's crazy. <laughs> Yeah, I don't know. We've run into some some child prodigies on this podcast, that's for sure. And Nicholas Payton is definitely one of them. Absolutely. He um, went on to have a steady gig with Danny Barker, who's a, a just a common name in the New Orleans scene. Before he went to college at the University of New Orleans, Nicholas Payton would go on to tour with Marcus Roberts and Elvin Jones in the early 90s. He was also in the movie Kansas City, with a, which has a lot of great jazz players in it. Um. Peyton won a Grammy in 1997 for his playing on the album Doc Cheatham and Nicholas Peyton. He had a recording contract with Verve Records and then went on to Warner Brothers and then soon founded his own label, BMF Records. He's collaborated or worked with the likes of Ray Brown, Dr. John, Clark Terry, Roy Haynes, Alan Toussaint, and the SF Jazz Collective. Also, the Blue Note 7 and the Czech National Symphony Orchestra, the Basel Symphony Orchestra, and many, many others. He's known for his provocative compositions and also from personal experience, I know that he has a very, very interesting Instagram page. So if you want, if you want to go be, give him a follow. Well, you know, he posts things. He's not afraid to post 
things that are political or he's very much into the idea that jazz is is hashtag black american music hashtag bam but he also posted some anti-mask um suggestive posts Hmm. so he's he's kind of all over the place with his instagram page and it's just very interesting to see what he's talking about next um so yeah, it's kind of cool to follow Nicholas Payton, even if you disagree. I mean, I disagree with some things and agree with others, but he's just a very provocative cat, and you'll see his name quite a bit. Yeah, that's very interesting. Yeah, I'm definitely going to uh, check out his his Instagram page. Cool. Let's get into um, – I'll go through Matt Stevens for us. He's the, jet, or the guitar player on the album. Um, he's a Canadian guitarist and composer. He was born in 1982 in Toronto. He studied guitar at a, a young age as well, and um, same as Terry Lynn Carrington, graduated from Berklee College of Music, as do many jazz modern jazz players um, go to Berklee. So he graduated from there in twenty or two thousand and four. Since he's recorded and performed with the likes of Christian Scott, uh, as friends of Spalding, has two albums as a leader himself, and has toured all throughout the world. He um, resides in New York City and is. Also, an adjunct faculty at the the new school. Yeah, and I've actually seen him play live. He's a great player, very technical player. Um, very, you know, his fingers are flying. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> when I saw him. Um, but he, you'll see his name quite a bit too. And and he does a lot of tours, backing up different people or doing just small group sessions. And he, he's a good guitar player in New York, and, and he's killing it. So he's on this album, and it's great to see him on it. Cool. Yeah, well, that's pretty much the whole main crew on the album. Let's go ahead and get into our album breakdown of all the tracks on the album. The first track on the album is entitled Windflower. Um, Max, why don't you tell us a little bit about, we want to talk about the composers because that's the focus of this album, being female composers. Max, why don't you tell us a little bit about the composer and about this track itself? Yeah, one flower, which you'll see both as one word and as two different words. You know, it's usually talking about the same tune. This one written by Sarah Cassie. Sarah Cassie was a pianist and composer born in 1929 in Detroit. She moved to New York in the 50s and worked for Riverside Records, where she met a number of jazz greats who would go on to record her compositions. People like Clark Terry, Johnny Griffin, Herb Ellis. And a lot of the cats from Detroit knew her. And she was known for writing kind of more through composed works most often. And she did not really perform. She was not necessarily a gigging musician, but she was well known as a composer. And she worked in the office for Riverside Records. She was involved in the scene in different ways. She died young at age 37 in 1966. And I could not for the life of me figure out how and what caused her death. Um, And this particular tune, Windflower, was recorded in 1975 by the great Hank Jones and remained a part of his personal repertoire for years and years. Um, So she's revered by a lot of jazz greats, and you'll see some of her compositions recorded from some very top players. And she was just one of the guys, you know, that was hanging out in the right spot at the right time and that's how her compositions got around but she herself was not really a player but it's great to see this on the album yeah i think that's super unique to have some music written by someone who's just a jazz composer and not really a player a lot of the music we have in the language comes from people who are playing and who are writing you know composing the songs for their own album so it is cool to have someone who's just a composer um, and have that featured on this album and a female composer. Um, Cool. Well, so it has kind of like a a syncopated intro on this one and then it has a a really nice melody and there's this, uh, I really dig, there's like this one, five, six chordal movement idea that keeps getting repeated throughout the song and repeated through the melody. And I really dig that. It has, it adds like a nice texture to, to the track. And another thing is I really like the instrumentation on this song there's no piano or keys but it doesn't i'm not really bothered by that feels like it doesn't really need that um yeah and so the guitar solo during the the guitar solo there's a good mix of different lines and ideas he starts kind of more bop but then brings in more blues towards the end so i like how he kind of mixes those two things in really well 
And then Elena Penderhues is um, our first guest on the album, which is very fitting, a female flautist and probably the best on the scene today. Um, And one thing that she does really well that I really like is she highlights the changes really well in her solo. And I really like that. She's got nice vibrato and she's got really good ideas. I think this is just a super well-rounded solo, which is pretty common from, from Elena. She's got a really good sense of feel and she's just... She's a really good player, and I, I really every time I listen to her, it's it's I enjoy it. So, I think she adds a lot to this track and to the overall album. I do want to mention the song is more or less uh, a minor blues, mm-hmm. so it follows you know the minor blues kind of chord changes and form. And during Elena Pender Hughes's solo, you can hear the form and the chords very clearly. Whereas behind the guitar solo, it's not quite as clear. You know, they're doing doing more behind him or or he's implying that you know he wants to go in a different direction and i just want to mention that the guitar solo is actually played by a guest guitarist mm-hmm. julian lodge mm-hmm. who you know he's kind of a child prodigy he's also now on bluno records and on the faculty at new england conservatory of music he's only 34 years old and he's killing it and so he's the guest guitarist on this track and on quite a few others we'll mention and I think you're right. There's a lot in the flute solo I dig. I love the vibrato. And then we get Nicholas Payton on trumpet, starting off with lower notes and building. And I feel like his solo really has a nice build to it. It seems to interact more rhythmically with what the rhythm section is doing. And I think there's just some more slightly musical ups and downs behind the trumpet solo. And it's just a little bit more dynamic as he goes on. He's also using some really high notes and simply playing long high notes. So that's a a different change of pace and a different approach to some of his improv. And it works well with how the drums and the guitar especially are playing underneath him. So it's cool to listen for the interaction that's going on behind the trumpet solo. And then after that, they get back to the head of 402, but it's very brief. And it's just the last four bars of the melody. Any lasting thoughts on that? There were there's some nice playing going on on this track. Yeah, I definitely I think that um, Elena kind of stands out to me on this track with her solo. I like the the sound of the song and I like the composition. That one five six movement, that kind of chordal um, idea that keeps getting you know brought up throughout really speaks to me. So yeah, there's some interesting things that I really those are the things that stand out to me about about this track. Yeah, I think you're right. Um, and then we go on. The second track on the album is called Circling, and this is a tune written by the great Gretchen Parlato, vocalist. She's an awesome singer. I've seen her perform live. She's got a very unique vibe to what she does, and all in all, she is a professional through and through. She was born in L.A. in 1976 to a musical father named Dave Parlato, bass player who played with anyone and everyone from Frank Zappa to the great Buddy Rich. She was influenced early on by Bossa Nova Records, a lot of the ones on Verve Records, and she was singing early on and eventually attended UCLA, majoring in jazz studies and also accepted into the Thelonious Monk Institute. She moved to New York in 2003, began recording by 2005, and has since performed and recorded quite often. She's been Grammy-nominated and featured as a guest on over 80 recordings working with such folks as Marcus Miller, Terrence Blanchard, Esperanza Spalding, Kenny Barron, and so many others. And she can be seen touring with the great SF Jazz Collective as well. So Gretchen Parlotto, I, you know, I, I, I'm not a huge fan of everything she does, but overall she has a very unique approach. And I love that they're doing this track, you know, this tune circling from Gretchen. It's a nice touch to the album. And I think overall it's got, it's for me it's one of the top tracks on the album Dwayne, what did you like about the intro did you hear anything you liked about the groove or the drum set what was going on in the in the beginning of circling yeah so i actually i was really digging this intro it kind of has like a um a hand drum going on of some sort i can't tell whether it's a djembe or what kind of drum but it's like some kind of hand drum going on and then there's a really cool like melodic bass line um it's not really a bass groove. It's kind of more like a melody coming from the bass and then keys as well. And then we kind of get the drum set set in and a bass groove um, as the melody comes in. So I think it's a, a really cool intro. It's kind of unique with the, the hand drum, the bass doing the melody and, and the keys there. 
yeah, it's a very unique intro to this song. And when the vocals come in, it's Michael Mayo singing it. And he's another guest on the album. He's originally more or less from L.A., born to a musical family. His father, Scott Mayo, was a sax player with the great Earth, Wind, and Fire. <laughs> and his mom was a backup vocalist to Diana Ross. And you'll see Michael Mayo's name uh, quite a bit. He now lives in New York performing and also has an album called Bones as a Leader. So we get Michael Mayo singing on this one. And in general, I just love the groove. I think it's a very accessible feel and a very accessible song to a listener audience. Um, here we actually get some keyboard that's very present. And the way the guitar and the keys interact they play together very nicely, and that is much harder to do than one would think because they're both chordal instruments. And so fundamentally, you know, their purpose within the ensemble is very similar. And the way they divide when and where they play and how they play and how they complement not only each other, but the music in general and everything going on, it's very professional how they're doing it. Um, I just love how they're interacting with each other and not getting in the way of each other and not getting in the way of the music. Yeah, I definitely can can feel that um, as a keyboard player. It can be hard to play with other chordal instruments in this setting because a lot of times you have a similar role. So, you know, at times it can be like you feel like you're stepping on each other's feet, but here they interact very well, like Max said. I definitely agree with that. Um, one thing I really like is uh, Linda May uh, Han O oh on this, the bass player. Her sense of groove is really good. Her feel is really good. She's in the pocket. Um, yeah, and then we get uh, Julian Lage solo, and it starts out with a melody quote, which I really like. That's you know, that's like an easy way to to start a uh, a solo out in a cool way, like just quote the melody. So yeah, don't don't forget the melody. It should be you know, it should be one of those go to sort of things in your mind to either mimic or pull from when you're soloing you don't want to get so far away from the basic melody that you just completely forget about it i mean you want to go out and, and be adventurous and explore and you know be full range on the instrument and, and yada yada but the melody is there for a reason yeah and well, i'm i'm with you on that yeah let it inspire you let it influence you start out with it and then take it in a different direction so definitely can appreciate that um one thing that's cool is there are some like sung insertions throughout uh Lage's solo from um uh, mayo which is cool i think they're they're cool and they're super tasteful they don't really overshadow what's going on from the solo so i think that's a, a nice touch and then um, Lage has a really cool use of the instrument's range. He has some really like kind of groovy stuff on the lower octaves of the guitar, which I, I really enjoy. Yeah, I would say at at you know certain moments, Julian is really digging in the lower range of the guitar. And at two twenty six to two thirty four, there's some nice, awesome repetition that's building and building, and it's it's just raising the overall you know musical dynamic. Um, as he repeats that rhythm and moves it to different notes and it just adds so much in terms of development of a solo and again it's another moment where you should not be afraid to repeat ideas <laughs> and build them we've yeah. talked about that quite a few times but that moment there 226 to 234 is a key example don't be afraid to repeat some ideas that that you're playing and he also towards the end end of his solo repeats some other ideas so some repetition that works well in that guitar solo and then we get a bass solo and here the band of course moves down dynamically to let the bass shine a little bit and come out the keys have some nice comping and there's some consistent percussive hits from terry lynn carrington it's kind of a short and sweet bass solo but it, it was kind of nice to do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah, one thing, uh, they kind of, they brought the hand drum back in on the bass solo, which is a nice touch. I like that, kind of bring the band back, bring bring the hand drum in, um, give it that kind of African feel to it. Um, the bass solo is definitely short, but grooving. I could have gone for a little bit more development, maybe a little bit longer solo. I feel like it, it just really didn't, it was short and sweet, but it didn't have time to go really anywhere. So I maybe could have gone for, another few measures of, of bass solo to let it kind of let Linda kind of 
get some more stuff out but it's it's definitely good with what you know what what it is being short and sweet yeah i agree and then the melody comes back in with the vocal um and then we hear nicholas payton right around 418 to 514 comes in for a solo behind the vocals and the interaction between nicholas payton and the vocals is is another cool moment where it's so musically I don't know, um, effective Mm -hmm. that you're enamored by how well they're interacting with each other. That's the great thing about this track circling is not only the instrumentation, but how are they complementing one another and how are they adding to the music? And they do it so superbly. Um, What did you think of that section? Yeah, I think that this is a super unique choice to go to the sung melody to the you know by mayo and then go into the trumpet solo you might more traditionally just see like back-to-back solos from julian lage and then nicholas payton and then have a bass solo that'd be the most standard jazz way to do it would be to have you know your um you know maybe either the rhythm or the wind instrument go first and then the bass solo be last and then you go back into the melody and then go out but i like that they kind of structure it a little bit differently they give us the melody again but then they kind of bring the melody and bring some singing in with the trumpet solo and it's just really tasteful um it it reminds me of a club sandwich yeah so the br- the bread you know that is the vocal melody and so you get some bread at the top you get some bread in the middle and you get some bread at the end and so that's where the vocals are in the trajectory or the you know outline of this track circling and that's how i was kind of thinking about it it's a very hefty very satisfying club sandwich yeah i like that comparison i think it has like kind of an extra layer to it that um some compositions maybe don't so i think that's a that's a really good point there and yeah i like that choice um the there are vocal harmonies behind the melody which sound to be a singular person's voice that's harmonized with itself. Um, if you there, if you like, you might be, you might know what I'm talking about, but there's a unique sound when different voices harmonize with each other versus, um, a singular person reharmonizing with themselves. Uh, so when different voices sing together, there's blending that goes on and blending is not going to be perfect between four different people. But when you're singing with yourself, it sounds much more, it's, it blends a lot more smoothly. So I think that what's going on here might be like a um, something that's put in later and it might be Michael Mayo um, singing all the harmonies and then putting them in later or he sung them before and they're like, there's some kind of way that they're inserting them in. But that's what it sounds like to me. At first I thought it might have been because you can also get um, like keyboard that have like oohs and ahs and you can it'll kind of sound that's what it almost sounds like it almost sounds like a synthetic synthesized um vocal thing but i think it's it actually is someone singing i wouldn't be surprised if it was michael mayo what do you think max yeah i think there's definitely some post-production going on you know where where you add layers um after the live recording happened and that is what's going on with michael mayo and you know what came to my mind that is not surprising, but a pop singer that is well versed in layering herself and creating her own harmonies in post production is Ariana Grande. She mm-hmm. does that, you know, she does that quite a bit, and I think she does it pretty well. And so this, you know, what happened there with Michael Mayo layering his his voice and harmonizing with himself there that reminded me of Ariana Grande actually. It's a very common thing in pop music. Adele does it a lot. Like her harmonies, yeah. instead of having backup vocalists, it'll be her own voice harmonizing. And it, it there's a different sound when you do that to versus having a, a backup um, group. But yeah, that's a good point. Yeah, it's very common in, in pop music. So we get kind of that in that aspect in, in this song here. And then I also dig the ending of Circling. The vocal enters again at 514. The rhythm section is kind of low dynamically, and they sneak kind of back in with an almost change of feel. It's almost a halftime feel, or it reminds me of a reggae beat a little bit. And it just adds another interesting dynamic layer musically. And then that change of feel sort of dissipates, and the ending is solidified with a nice cymbal ring. And no vocal at the very end. Did you hear that change of feel? Yeah, I definitely did. It was, 
yeah, there's definitely some kind of like syncopation. Um, yeah, I don't know if I quite classify it as reggae, but it definitely had some like maybe like African like um, what's the like Caribbean kind of feel to it for sure. Yeah, Afro Caribbean elements yeah. there at the end for sure. Um, so I think all in all, circling is a very great track. Yeah, number three. You know, the third track on the album, Unlifted Heart. There's a lot going on with this tune. We're going to dig in a little bit and we'll see what we come up with. Um, If you don't know, this song was written by Shami Royston. She is the sister to saxophone player Tia Fuller and is a Denver-born pianist, born to a bass player father and a vocalist mother. Shami was a staple in the Denver scene who eventually moved to New York City after completing her studies in the Denver area. She's worked with Ron Miles, Christian McBride, Ralph Peterson, Jill Shaw, Camille Thurman, and a host of others. And her husband is drummer Rudy Royston. So very musical person. And we get un, uh, what Unlifted Heart, I think is the name of it. Yeah, um, Unlifted Heart. Uplifted Unlifted Heart. heart uplifted Up, yeah that's what i thought i wrote down the wrong word <laughs> that's okay Up, uplifted heart yeah uplifted heart is the name of the tune it features a number of guest artists um including i'm gonna say miss santos her first name is spelled n-e-g-a-h i'm not even gonna try and pronounce that i don't want to get in trouble <laughs> uh but i'm gonna say miss santos she's a hand percussionist and a vocalist from brazil who works with the great John Batiste on the Stephen Colbert show. And also we get a guest artist, Val Genti, electronic music composer, percussionist, and producer, originally from Haiti, and saxophonist Ravi Coltrane, the son of John and Alice Coltrane, who grew up in LA. Um, and if you don't know, his dad, John Coltrane, passed when he was only two years old, so he didn't really know his father. But Ravi uh, studied at the California Institute of the Arts and has played and recorded with the likes of Jeff Tane Watts, Eric Harland, Jerry Allen, Elvin Jones, and countless others. So it's great to see Ravi Coltrane on this record, too. Yeah, yeah, it always is great to get um, Ravi on on an, on a track, on a record. So, yeah, and this is a very interesting track, and he's definitely um, heavily featured on it. So, yeah. The way the track starts, it, it starts with some spoken word, and I'm not exactly sure who's doing that. Um, but it, it reminds me of, you know, a definite influence or a definite ode to African music mm-hmm. that we're getting here with this opening. There's some opening sounds from percussion and some low siren sounds, and it kind of sounds like the ocean is going on in the background. In my mind, that's what I came up with. And then the spoken word continues as a groove starts to enter right around the 38 second mark. What do you think of that intro? Yeah, it's definitely I get that ocean feeling a lot on this album. Actually, I got that kind of that kind of vibe often. Um, But yeah, I it's really interesting. There definitely is African influence and there's African percussive instruments going on. And one instrument that I think I can't tell exactly the difference. So I if we have anyone who's a percussionist and who's um a little bit more knowledgeable about african percussive instruments i think that the instrument at the beginning is an embira which is a wooden board that has metal tines affixed to it a kalimba is another kind of embira that um you might know of and so it makes sound by you um you pluck the the tines with your finger and the metal vibrates on the wooden board and that's what gives you the sound I feel like that's what this instrument is, but it could very well be like a wooden marimba as well. So if we have anyone who can tell the difference between those, I would love to get your opinion on that Um, because I'm not quite sure. I'm fairly certain it's one of the two, and it's definitely African percussion. Um, But yeah, I heard that, and I was kind of like, huh, what's that instrument? Like that has a very unique sound to it. Um, A very, you know, you can tell it's something, a wooden hollow wooden thing that's being struck it's just how's it being struck is it there a metal tine or is it a mallet so um yeah but i think it's a cool ode to to african spiritual music here with the spoken word and the the african percussion there are moments where it sounds like a marimba and there are moments where it sounds like an ambira to me yeah and it's hard to tell so one of those or something very similar i think is what's going on and we get some really neat 
solidified time signatures that start to happen after that sort of initial intro. Um, we're thinking it's what ten eight when the flute starts to solo. Is that right? Yeah, ten eight. It yeah, it's almost certainly ten eight. Um, there, it doesn't. It grouped more like ten eight than it is five four, which are subdivided a little bit differently. Ten eight. Five four you get like either three two, which is the most common, uh three and then two subdivision. But with ten eight you kinda get like a two dotted quarter notes and then two quarter note subdivision in ten eight, which this feels like instead of being like a three two kind of subdivision. Yeah, and if you listen to what the bass player is doing, that kind of really solidifies ten eight instead of five four. Mm-hmm. And just the way, you know, the you would think that one measure is organized. Yeah. Um so, yeah, so we're thinking 10 8 there. Um, and when that flute enters, Elena is doing a lot of longer, lower notes. And then there's some really nice vibrato, some nice interplay musical sec- inter- insertions, I should say, from the percussion, too. So, listen to what's going on behind the flute solo. And in general, I think Elena is using shorter ideas and shorter phrasing, but it, it the, the sound seems really influenced by African mu- music. And there are moments here that remind me a bit of some moments on the album, The Spirit of N2, mm-hmm. that was you and I reviewed from um, Indizuzo Makatini on our second episode. So if you want to check out similar music, check out that album, In the Spirit of N2. And there's some connections there musically that are going on here that I felt. And I love the longer held out note filled with, great vibrato that Elena Pinder Hughes is doing from 253 to 302. And that kind of signals the next section that comes after it. Yeah. And Max, how many songs do you know in 10, eight or have you played in 10, eight? I, it's very seldomly used. So it's unique. I don't, yeah, I can't think of one. Yeah, no. Yeah. <laughs> so, but that's definitely what we've got here. And it's, yeah, it's unique. Um, and it gives this song kind of, there's a lot going on in this song. There's a lot for us to break down. Um, and that's just kind of one unique aspect of it is the first time signature we're getting is 10-8. So that's that's super cool. Elena, definitely, I think one thing she does super well is use space um, very well, which she does very often very well. And she kind of fits into that African spiritual music feel very well. Um, so she's very tasteful there. And then, yeah, after the, it's 10-8 until they get into the melody, which is in 3-4, and then they kind of go back and forth between 10-8 and 3-4 as they go from melody to um, solos and stuff. So pretty pretty cool there. Yeah, we're, we're getting multiple time signatures here, 10-8, 3-4, and going back and forth. And that horn melody, you're right, when it comes in, that's the 3-4 time signature. And you got saxophone, trumpet, and flute blending together to make that melody. It's very nice, very blended, you know, Great sound going on. And then we get a Ravi Coltrane solo after um, sort of the background speaking enters too. And Ravi sticks to shorter phrases. There's lots of lower notes at the start of a solo and then longer mid-range notes behind the horn melody back in. And there's a lot going on. What'd you hear? Yeah, so one thing I want to point out is that this solo that Ravi, his first solo they does is kind of short, but it's in 10-8. So they're still doing kind of that alternating between 10-8 and 3-4. So he's going to play his solo in 10-8, and then they go back into 3-4 in the melody. But then he's going to take a longer solo, and we're going to get into some stuff there. So this first Ravi solo is in 10-8, like Elena's was as well. You're right, and it is shorter. Um, And then... Before the horn melody comes back in, um, he's doing a lot of those mid-range notes. And then there's an immediate sort of space that comes in right at 455. And then there's some sounds back in. And then Lynn Carrington does sort of an eighth note count in on the drums. You know, she doesn't count it in on the stick. She actually plays a sort of, you know, back in. After they're going one time through the out, sort of uh, time signature or feel that Ravi Coltrane plays a longer solo over. And we've established in our minds that it's sort of a palindrome time signature movement where you're having uh, a set of five followed by a set of six followed by a set of seven and then back to six. So you're kind of doing this five, six, seven, six, five, 
movement over and over again with the time feel and Ravi Coltrane is soloing on top. You you pointed that out to me and and we double checked it. What do you think of that? You know, there's a lot going on there that's really, really cool. Yeah, this is probably the track of all the tracks on the album that I spent the most time just rewinding and listening to because this section, you can tell that the whole phrase is 24 eighth notes. So it's 5 8. Max said in 5, but yeah, so 5 8, 6 8, 7 8, and then back to 6 8. Um, and yep. you, you can tell that the whole phrase is 24 beats, but you can also tell that it's not divided into a common meter. It's not four. It's not like something like that. It's definitely mixed. So Max and I took the time and we could tell, okay, well, the first the first measure seems to be five, right? So if, if you break it down, our, uh, our um, interpretation of it is, yeah, five, six, seven, six. And that's one time through the phrase. But then it goes back five, six, seven, six, five. So that's that kind of, it's really cool. It's kind of like a palindrome. Like it's just like, they're going, you know, so that's, uh, I think it's super unique. It has a cool groove to it. Um, but yeah, this track has just got a lot going on. We get 10, eight, um, we get three, four, which is the most like kind of more common thing in this song is just having some three, four. And then we get this cool kind of mixed meter, uh, section going on. And yeah, Ravi does a really good job, um, soloing over this. There's a lot of space, which kind of lets that that feel and that meter kind of uh, express itself use of short phrases in the groove, which makes sense. Um, and there's definitely one thing that um, we noticed as well. There's just so much going on is that there's a really interesting percussion going on as well. And there's something that sounds like a record scratch. Um, I think five Oh four is the first time you get it. And so I, yeah, I want our listeners to listen to that and tell us what you think that is. Cause we have a couple theories about what it is. One is that it could be a percussion instrument, but I've never heard even like a scratch a percussion scratch instrument that sounds like that because it sounds like a record scratch, like the kind of wah to a record scratch. Um, a second theory is that it could be a guitar player because guitars can kind of make that sound, but there's no guitar on the track, so that doesn't make a whole lot of sense. And then one thing that Max brought up is that one of the guests on the track is actually an electronic music composer. So I think the most likely thing is that there's some kind of drum pad with a record scratch that's getting brought into this section. Max, what is, what's your, your inkling about what's your inclination about this, uh, this unique sound going on there. For some reason, I want to say it's guitar, but it, that doesn't make as much sense as it does, as it should, because you're right earlier in the, on the track, there is no guitar. So either they added the guitar in (laughs) post-production or he just sat there until the very end and they told him (laughs) hey make some sounds buddy (laughs) uh so i don't know if that makes sense but probably some sort of hand drum uh not hand drum but electronic you know um sort of drum sound from val genti kind of makes sense to me um there's just a host of guests on here and and it could be any of those you know, ideas that we're coming up with. Um, but you're right. It does sound like a record scratch, like it's a hip hop record from the late eighties, early nineties that uses those kinds of sounds like a DJ would on a, you know, at a club. Yeah. Yeah. So, that's the sound that we're getting. It's a, like a record scratch kind of sound. That's what they're going for. Max, I want to know, what do you think about this, this mixed meter that we get and um, how Ravi approaches his solo? What are, what are your thoughts on that? Being a saxophone player. I, well, I think it's very intelligent the way Ravi Coltrane is treating how to play over that because sometimes in those situations, if you play too much or if you play longer phrases, which I sometimes tend to do, um, it can get in the way of the feel and you lose yourself in certain moments because it's it's you know, you're going from a grouping of five to a grouping of six to a grouping of seven back to six back to five. So every sort of measure, the feel is changing. Yeah. How so, do you play something that makes sense? And I think the easiest way to do it is to play less and play more rhythmically. That's the way that will make the most sense. Yes. Yeah, so I, I think you're right. Messing around with the rhythm, using space. And I think there are moments that Ravi is using a lot of intervallic movement where you're taking an idea and then just moving it in short intervals downward or upward 
and he's doing a lot of that, which which kind of makes sense. And to me, you know, six is going to feel very differently than five. Seven is, is somewhere in between in terms of comfortability. You know, six, you know, one, two, three, four, five, six, six, eight feels usually a little more comfortable to me personally. They're and just five, all so different. Like the way that you yeah. think about playing a song like Take Five versus playing you know, a song in six, eight. And I don't, there, there are definitely songs. Oh, we talked about a song in seven. That one that was, uh, Jamie Merritt's song. What was that? That was in seven. No Mo. No Mo. Yeah. No Mo from, uh, two continents, one groove featured on one of our episodes from TS monk. Um, there are, there are a few tunes in seven that you'll come across. And then a lot of players like to do songs like all the things you are in seven. Mm Mm-hmm or in three and you change, you know, tunes that you normally play in four into a seven feel. Um, so that happens quite a bit. And you know, that's, that's kind of common, but here what they're doing is, it's just throwing it all quite, in together, like into one kind of long phrase, like it's a 24 beat kind of thing, you know, but it's the way it's divided. It has a lot of syncopation to it in that bar of seven, they're not really playing. It's not like you, it's not like your typical one two one two one two three one two one two one two three. They're like it's like the rhythm syncopated. I think they're like they're on the two, you know. So it's not your typical. You're not really feeling it. Like it was hard to even count it. Um. So it's very it's a very unique approach to adding these different meters in. Yes, the way the rhythm section is playing over that seven feel. They're very syncopated. They're making hits on the ands of of certain beats where normally if you were just clearly defining the seven, eight feel, you wouldn't do that. Yeah. You know, you, you do more emphasis on the one and they're not doing that. So you just had to count it out and, and see what it felt like. It's a very cool moment and it is a palindrome and it's, it's just so unique what they're doing there. And Ravi does a really great job of, you know, putting forth a great solo in a situation like that that's not quite comfortable um and then later on there's some interspersions from the trumpet and some busier playing from terry lynn carrington and then they of course move down dynamically by 625 and it kind of dissipates into nothingness with only vocal take uh vocal talking um being heard at the very end kind of similar to the beginning so it's a nice bookend of some talking going on, but there's a lot of stuff in the middle and there's some just fantastic playing and treatment going on of different time signatures and some nice interaction between the instruments. Yeah. And uh, I just want to, if like, I want people to go and listen to this and give us like, if you think that we're interpreting something, cause this is just how we're interpreting it. These mixed meters, you could interpret it differently. I mean, you could interpret it as 11, eight and not five and then six. If you, you know, there's, so I want to, I'm interested to see, like go and listen to it with an open mind and tell us your thoughts on the song and like what's going on in this song and what's going on with that record scratch. What's going on with those mixed meters at the end. I'm interested to hear what other people have to say. That's just the way that we are looking at it, you know, and we think that it's written in that way. So yeah, it's definitely, uh, be interested to hear what other people have to say about that. Yeah. Feel free to email us the jazz jam podcast at gmail.com or post a comment on our Instagram page or DM us and follow our website. <laughs> so <laughs> we'll talk more about that later. Um, yeah. But there's the, lot, yeah. Let us know what you think. The easiest way is to just go our websites linked in the, um, the show notes and everything is on our website, our Instagram, our email, every way to contact us. So the easiest thing to do is just go to our website and literally all of our information's there. So check out the the show notes. Cool. Let's get into the the next song on the album, Max. Yeah, the fourth tune is called Moments. This was written by Brazilian born pianist Eliane Elias, who was born in nineteen sixty. She studied piano at age seven, began gigging and teaching in Brazil as a teenager, and moved to New York to attend Juilliard in 1981. Elias has since played and performed quite often. She's won a Grammy for Best Latin Jazz Album for her album Mirror Mirror, and she was previously married to the great uh, trumpet player Randy Brecker. So, Mm. very key player in this music, and, and she's quite active too. You'll see her name quite a bit 
And this also has some special guests, including Diane Reeves, the jazz vocalist born in Detroit in 1956, but she grew up in Denver. She began singing and playing piano around 1971. She would perform with Clark Terry early on. She studied classical voice at the University of Colorado, moved to L.A., then to New York, and has performed or recorded with the likes of Billy Child, Stanley Turrentine, Herbie Hancock, Tony Williams, and the list goes on. She was also signed to Bluno Records, and her tone kind of reminds me of a mix of Dinah Washington and Carmen McRae with some sprinkled in Vanessa Rubin, if I were to describe her. So I, I like Diane Reeves a lot, and I've, I she does really well on this track. Yeah, yeah, this track is definitely um a little, it's different than the other vocals on the album. Um we get more of a, a ballad feel on this track. Max, why don't you tell us a little bit more about um, the feel of this track? You're right. It's a slower tempo. Um, there's some nice longer notes that you hear from the sax with the moving guitar line. There's some space before Diane enters with the vocal melody. It's musically moving, but there's lots of looseness in the approach. It's not very driving per se, but there are some very cool syncopated movements rhythmically as well that help move it along. Um, but it's not like a full force. Here we go. We're, we're pushing ahead. It's a much more loose feel going on. And Ravi Coltrane is in and out and there's some neat call and response between the sax and vocals too. Another great moment where there's just some undeniable, fantastic interaction going on between the different parts, musically speaking. And you can hear that at 2.13 onward. And then there's some mirrored movement on the saxophone from the vocal line. Another key moment of interaction that is undeniably tasty. <laughs> <laughs> so a lot of great moments there. And I think everyone is listening to each other. And they're listening to everything going on around them. And they're letting the music breathe and, and flow in its own sort of way. I just, again, the interactions are just executed quite nicely. Yeah, yeah, I agree with a lot of that. Um, I I don't have a whole lot to say about this track, but there are a couple points that um I want to make. Uh, there's some really nice low vibrato in the vocals. Like Max said, I like the kind of ebb and flow of the tempo on this. Um, it's not super driving, but it's very dialed. It's very together. Um, and it's nice. And then there's kind of like a, it's kind of more emotional over the bridge, like kind of higher reaching from the vocals, which is nice. Um, a different quality there from the, from the vocalist here. And the form is an A, A, B form and it gets repeated twice. Um, and then, yeah, like Max said, I think it's just a really good job accompanying the singer by the band here. They're listening super well. Um, everything's musical. It's tasteful. And then they just kind of end the tune at the end of the bridge the, the second time. Yeah, we kind of hear like an elongated bass note to close it out. Uh, th there's a couple of tracks on this album uh, that I question the endings of and mm. the way they did them, and this is one of those moments. I'm not really digging specifically how they ended the track. Um, it's not terrible. It's it's performed pretty yeah. decently, but I'm just I just think there could be more attention given to how you're ending this one that's a great point because i think there's so much attention compositionally like what's going on in the tracks and then it feels like the end of the tracks get a little they don't get as much attention i definitely see what you're saying there i think there could be a little bit more done with the endings of the tracks to make them a little bit more interesting and this one is one that i very much noticed it just felt like it kind of just ended and so yeah so with that we move on to the fifth track on the album called continental cliff this one was written by Patricia Perez, a Latin American saxophone player and professor at Berklee College of Music, one of the early pioneers of the music therapy field. Um, Perez toured and performed all throughout the world, and such mentors of Patricia's include the great Wayne Shorter and Jackie McLean, or McLean. So uh, she's she's in it. <laughs> <laughs> um and this song, Continental Cliff, begins with a bass solo. There's some nice extended movements, including bends and fast finger plucking. And I'm glad to see quite a bit of bass being featured here. Mm -hmm. um, it's just a nice touch to the album. And you hear how the horns and the rhythm section are playing the melody kind of together, and they interact very rhythmically. 
And then as it goes on, a groove from the drums and bass is established right before the trumpet solo. So there's some very nice development as this track starts and continues to grow. And um, I don't know, there's, there's, there's some movement there that I really do appreciate. And then trumpeter Nicholas Payton plays many eighth note upward moving ideas in his solo. Most often he's playing shorter phrases that tend to move up while using higher notes on the horn as the solo keeps going. There's some out chromatic movements right at 154, and there's a lot of high note lip falls into some other notes that are that he just moves in and out of quite nicely. What did you think of that solo? Any uh, comments or thoughts? Yeah, one thing that stood out to me about the solo was there's like some kind of random piano insertions going on. And it um, kind of had a free jazz kind of element to it. And the drums kind of uh, Terry Lynn Carrington kind of gets in on it as well. But it feels like the the song keeps its form, you know, throughout the whole thing, even though there's kind of these kind of phases of kind of some freer jazz elements going on there. Yeah. As the solo continues, you do hear that free jazz sort of thing, but they're keeping time and they're yep. keeping the form. Yep. They're just moving in interactively loosely. Yep. And there's some sort of, you're right, there's a lot of piano back and forth with the trumpet. And it's almost staccato stabbing ideas that they're doing. And that sort of transitions into a piano solo with constant bass grumblings underneath and some nice rhythmic drum hits. And that's where that free jazz moment really hits. And you get some backgrounds from the horns, which, which I think are a nice touch. Again, the tempo is consistent, but they're playing around a lot with the feel and the rhythm quite a bit. And then a sort of solid head-banging groove hits right at 334 before, before the horn melody enters in. And that is almost like a shout chorus, mm -hmm. what they're playing. And right after that, the head comes back in. Yeah, and this song definitely has like a certain kind of um, Latin feel to it. Uh so, yeah, and I think, um, yeah, that tag section, it almost feels like a shout chorus, but it's not like a traditional shout chorus with, like, the whole band playing. Like, I don't, it's a little different. Like, it's more of, like, a tag kind of section. Um, and I love the hits on the head out. Um, I think there are just some really great rhythmic elements to this tune with a kind of Latin groove feel. Um, and there's kind of free jazz hints without ever fully devolving into like free jazz Ornette Coleman kind of thing. Um, so they kind of take it out there and kind of loosen it up a little bit without ever fully losing sight of the form or the groove. So I think that's a really cool um, element to this track. That's right. I agree. A lot of things going on, a lot of different influences and it's, it's really cool to see how they're connecting certain ideas. And I just meant that in sort of the arrangement of the song, if you were going to, you know, lay it out. I just think that that horn melody that comes in after that 334 mark, it, I don't know what else to call it yeah. other than a shout course. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And that's <laughs> like know? how it operates, but it doesn't, it's not, it doesn't sound like your t traditional shout chorus. Absolutely. But it's operating in that same fashion. You're right. You're right. And then we move on to the sixth track on the album called throw it away. This is another cool track that I really dig. This one written by Abby Lincoln, originally named Anna Marie Woolridge, who was born in Chicago in 1930, heavily influenced by Billie Holiday, recorded for Riverside Records early on and was featured on Max Roach's We Insist protest record. Abby Lincoln was known for being active in the civil rights movement, and many of her lyrics reflected that. She would also be signed to Verve Records later on in her career, and she was also an actress. And... At one time, she had been married to the great Max Roach from 1962 to 1970. I never knew she was married to Max mm. Roach. I mean, I knew they were kind of close, um, especially in the mid-60s, but they were closer than I ever expected. <laughs> <laughs> we also get some guest vocalists on here. Melanie Charles is a Brooklyn-based singer-songwriter and flute player of Haitian descent. She sort of spans the jazz, soul, and experimental music spectrum as well as Haitian roots music. In 2010, she graduated from the New School of Jazz and studied with the likes of Reggie Workman, Bobby Sanabria, Junior Mance, and many others. 
She's performed internationally and has been featured on TV, including Good Morning America and The Late Show with Colbert. So you'll see Melanie Charles a little bit. And there's another guest vocalist, Somi, known as just by her first name, but her full name, Somi Kakoma, is a singer, composer, and writer born in Illinois to African immigrants, often known for straddling the worlds of African jazz, soul, and pop music, has won many awards and has recorded a number of al albums, currently seeking a doctorate at Harvard's Department of Music. And Somi is kind of known for her activism as well. And there's some great interaction between those two vocalists. I, I love seeing them on this, this track. The way it begins, we get some chanting along with some African drumming at the top. And it's another moment where it is definitely an ode to Africa. Um, the band comes in with some cool ostinato movement. There's a four bar idea from the bass and some nice easygoing keys. Then the keys kind of get heavier as the feel opens up a bit right at that 47 second mark. What'd you think of that intro? Yeah, I thought it's cool. And one thing I think is cool about um, this album is it there's a lot of kind of um, odes to African music and African spiritual music without, but it's more in like a modern jazz context. It's not quite like in the spirit of Into, which is just really African spiritual music influence like very heavily. This kind of has more subtle odes to it with some different percussive instruments and features, which I think is really cool. Um, so that's one thing that I notice about this, the beginning of this track and this album in general. Yeah, it seems like they're melding together African music and American jazz music more uh, interconnectedly than you know, some of Indiduzo Makatini's music and some of the South African jazz players. Um, it, it's kind of like, yeah, the mixing of, of both sorts of cultural norms and musical norms that go on. And I, I think it's very nice uh, how they do it. Yeah, I think it makes sense because, you know, Terry Lynn Carrington and these players are American jazz players. So their music is kind of modern American jazz with influence from African music, but Nduduzu Makatini and that group, they're African musicians. They're from Africa. So their music feels almost like African spiritual music with American jazz kind of mixed into, you know? So it feels like, you know, it makes sense that this would be kind of more hinting at African music and Nduduzu Makatini is more African, way more African and hinting more at, you know, like mixing in the jazz to it. I think that's a great point. That's the way to look at it. Um, so you, you get that in that first minute of this track, and then the vocal will enter at 55 seconds, and there's some cool guitar sounds. And that is almost another element of musical influence being introduced into the song, where we get an almost Spanish style, or I don't know, flamenco sort of style or influence. Did you hear that? Well, how would you describe that guitar sound there? Any yeah. thoughts on that? Um, and, th and that kind of comes in and out throughout the album at different moments, too. Yeah. Um, I don't, is this the track? There definitely is some flamenco guitar. I don't know if this was the track that I was. Yeah. I think it comes in later, too. Yeah. I really heard it on, yeah, a later track. But um, I, I'm not exactly sure. I would have to listen to it to because I, I don't I'm not specifically remembering remembering that there with the guitar. Well, if you're listening, check that out because it'll come. We'll talk more about it in, yeah. in a few minutes. But then the first vocalist comes in, who I think is Somi Kakamomo. Uh, sorry, Kakoma. Uh, please forgive me for my mispronunciation. <laughs> um, but I think it's Somi. If I'm wrong on that, um, we'll have to just fix it later. But <laughs> I think she has a nice sense of movement and a lot of subtle dynamics. It's a cool use of, of some vibrato at the ends of her phrases. And then the second vocalist comes in right at 206. And there's a little difference in timbre. It's a little darker and a bit more playful with the bendings of notes and the ends of her phrases or syllables. And there's sort of slightly faster and shorter vibrato being used from the second vocalist. So it's neat to listen for the differences in approach and timbre the way the two vocalists are singing. Um, and then we get a piano solo. I feel like the pianist is, is poking at me 
with some of the pianist phrases. I don't know. It's sort of short rhythmic ideas at first and then longer repeated improvisations. And they continue to use this sort of almost short stabbing articulation on and off. And it just seems like they're poking me in the back every few seconds. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, I think there definitely is an interesting development in the piano. So it, very, it starts very kind of short and abrupt with the the phrases but then it kind of gets into some more fleshed out ideas and lines which i think is a, a cool interesting development but it is very very kind of ostinato like staccato there at the the beginning uh, i definitely get what you're you're saying that it almost feels like they're kind of poking at the the piano right and then the vocal um comes back in with some speaking and some humming that's going on and it's a neat approach it creates a very dynamic texture to the overall effect of the song it's not merely just singing lines and i love the interplay that happens between the two vocalists that seems to develop as the tune goes on what do you think of that moment yeah for sure i like how that interlude kind of you get that spoken kind of thing um and then yeah you get the melt when you get the melody we get both singers on the the head out so i think that's really cool they kind of start to get some interplay back and forth but then when we get into the melody you get both singers which is nice and some really nice uh vocal harmonies on the way out yeah the very end you get really nice harmonization and longer phrases that the vocalists are doing and then at the very end you get the ringing sort of lingering piano pedal chord at the very end so not a bad ending there but maybe more could have been done what'd you think yeah, just a kind of another ending that just feels like it wasn't the attention to detail wasn't as much there in the ending as the rest of the track. Um, one thing that I want to point out before we move on is the kind of there's the difference in the approaches from the two singers. The first singer, um, there's a really nice use of mixed voice, which is when you mix your head voice and your chest voice, it has a very cool kind of um quality to it when someone's singing in mixed voice. Uh it gives like a very supportive, powerful presence um, to her singing kind of throughout her range, whether she's singing higher or lower. And um, she transitions really well from this mixed voice, um, from her chest voice into the mixed voice and upwards. So I think that's really good to um, point out. And then the second singer, I don't I don't know which one's which, um, but uh, a very nice full lower register and chest voice from the second singer. Some really good lower vibrato. And then I really love the kind of use of different vowel placements. If you listen to her vowel placements, um, some unique open and closed front and back kind of vowel placements. We kind of talked about um, those kinds of things when we listened to to Nancy Wilson. But um, yeah, so definitely different kind of approaches and some different things I noticed from each of the, the singers on this track. Yeah, thank you for explaining that. I was hinting at that when I first was talking about it, but that explains it better. Um, and you know what to say. <laughs> <laughs> In terms of vocalists, more so than I do. Um, but yeah, I think the vocals is what to listen for on that track called Throw It Away. And then we get the seventh track on the album called Respected Destroyer. This one written by Brandy Younger, a harpist who infuses classical, soul, jazz, and funk influences into the harp tradition. Brandy was born in 1983 in Hempstead, New York, studied harp early on and went to the University of Hartford where um, Brandy was mentored by Jackie McLean and went to study at NYU. Brandy Younger has since recorded and performed with the likes of Ravi Coltrane, Lauren Hill, John Legend, Christian McBride, yada, 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 mm -hmm. has been Grammy nominated, has won many other awards, known as an educator, and is teaching at NYU and giving master classes all over the country. So this is one by the Brandy Younger called Respected Destroyer, and this one is kind of a sort of jazz rock tune, I would call it, um, as it you know solidifies. But in the beginning, there's some nice sort of uh, rhythmic ostinato to start. And there I'm getting that sort of rock and roll or rock or metal vibe going on. Um, how would you describe this track? If you were going to call it, you know, tell somebody what it is in terms of a genre or an overall feel. What would you say about Respected Destroyer? Yeah, we're definitely getting some fusion feel here. Um, and I definitely agree. You get like a heavier, almost rock groove to it. So there's kind of a heavier groove to it. Um, there's some 
cool piano pedal notes, which help kind of give it that characteristic of that kind of heavier rock groove. And then there's a really cool and uh, dark and kind of ominous melody. So it definitely feels like you're getting some fusion here. It feels like kind of rock and jazz kind of fusion. And it's really cool. It's it's way different than anything we've done on on the um the podcast thus far i can't think of another track that has similar qualities to it so um it's cool to hear something a little bit different that's a good point the first solo on the track is the flute player um so we get some elena pinder hughes here and i think she's using more of the higher range and good use of space some nice repetition you can hear at 201 to 208 where she develops and adds to her to a rhythmic idea that she repeats on the flute over and over again there's a number of busier triplet ideas and she's using more of the flutes range towards the end of her solo ending on a lower note and there's just an overall nice arc to the flute solo yeah i think elena is just spot on as i've mentioned she usually is um she starts with some cool repetition like max said that section from two minutes to 210 it's just so grooving and it's just it kind of is um representative of elena's playing it's so grooving her feel is so great she's just awesome and it's just her development so well like she develops a solo so well she keeps you interested she's so well-rounded she's such a a fantastic player this solo is is super well done and then we get into a trumpet solo from nicholas payton and it's not too busy on this trumpet solo but it's i think it's super thoughtful and well developed as the dynamics build throughout the solo um and one thing this kind of says to me is you don't have to play a million notes to be musical you can be musical with very few notes it's just about how you um how you go about what the the tune that you're playing in. So I think that Nicholas Payton kind of demonstrates that super well. Doesn't have to play a bunch of notes. He can be musical in different ways and incorporate it into the track super well. Overall, I'm getting a sense that texture and effect Mm -hmm. matter more than the improvisatory lines themselves. And it's just great food for thought. Maybe approach different solos in varying contexts differently. Mm -hmm. And maybe the job of a soloist changes dependent upon the context of everything else that's going on around them as a soloist. That's a great point. Like, what are you trying to add to the song? Cause sometimes people think about solos. They're just like, what can I play? Like what notes can I play that are, you know, interesting? What lines can I play? You know, like kind of look at it like, Oh, let's make this, you know, like let's play these cool bop lines or do these. But this shows you, you can think about different things when you're selling, what can I add to this track? And sometimes it's not about the, the notes that you play or the lines that you play, it's about how you play what you're playing. And I think Nicholas Payton does a really good job there, and that's a good point, Max. Right. Are you musically reflecting what's going on around you and your role in the ensemble at the time of which you're soloing? You and can, that's what you, that is. You could play the craziest, coolest lines ever, and if it doesn't fit with the track, it's not a good solo. You know, I mean, it might be cool. It might be – there might be – awesome licks and stuff but if it doesn't fit what's going on it's not that you know like you're better off just you know listening and playing with what's going on so yeah for sure that's right that's right and the horns come back in at 347 um it's another moment where it sounds like a melodic shout chorus almost you know if you think about where where you would place it in the arrangement the energy builds from the drums and the rhythm section and then they move downward dynamically by the 420 mark. So there's a lot of movement in terms of dynamics. And after that 420 mark, you get some sax and flute added falls and improvisations that are used sparingly. So they're not getting in the way of anything or the groove. They're just doing some short improvisatory ideas to add on top. And they're making sure not to overdo it. If we're on a journey here, floating away on a magic carpet into the mist, that's what would be going on in the background. <laughs> that's I, <laughs> what's, I yeah. love that because uh, that's kind of what I got. You know, we get back in the melody and the melody kind of evolves into this spacey feel, but it's still it's still in time. It's still there's still a jam. And I, I love the different sounds and effects that's going on here. Yeah, it feels like I kind of felt like I was floating out into space. But I, I yeah. So I think they're doing a good job of kind of uh, getting at that, you know. Yeah, it's the last scene of the movie where you're floating away on the magic carpet into the (laughs) moonlight (laughs) and then the credits hit. 
Yeah. So that's what's going on right at the end. Cool ending. Over- this is the co- this is yeah, one time they ended a song in a very um thoughtful way. Or the most thoughtful way on the album in my opinion thus far. I w- I was going to say there they gave some attention and some drive and some energy to the ending of Respected Destroyer and it makes a makes for a, for a nice arrangement and overall effect. And then we get the eighth song on the album called Two Hearts aka Lawns. So there's kind of two names to it. Written by Carla Blay or Blee, spelled B L E Y. I've heard it pronounced both ways. Who um, is a composer, piano player, and band leader born in 1936 in California to a musical mom who encouraged her to learn piano and to sing. She lost her dad at an early age and eventually would move to New York by the age of 17, where she met pianist Paul Blee at Birdland while she was working at Birdland as a cigarette girl. The two married in 1957, and he encouraged her to start start composing. Along the way, people began recording her songs, including Jimmy Jeffrey and George Russell. She helped organize the Jazz Composers Guild and then would go on to marry Michael Mantler, an avant-garde trumpeter, and she was big in the free jazz movement. She would also work with people like Charlie Hayden, Gary Burton, Nick Mason, and Steve Swallow, She's still alive today and seems to be emotionally involved with Steve Swallow. So I think she's she's with Steve now. And she's really just always seen herself as a composer. And she's written a lot of tunes. And th- this is another person that's, you know, has seen themselves as composers first and not as a player or gigging musician. So both Carla Blee and... Um, Sarah Cassie, I think, from the first track on the album, that composer, they both kind of see themselves in a similar light as composers first. Yeah, yeah, I think that's super unique um, and cool to know on this this album. Um, cool, let's get into the track itself a little bit, Max. Yeah, we also get a guest vocalist, Samara Joy, who is a 22-year-old vocalist, grew up in the Bronx, an up-and-comer in the jazz scene after winning the Sarah Vaughan International Jazz Vocal Competition in 2019. She just came out with an album on Verve Records called Linger a While. I've listened to it. I love it. She's performed with the likes of Emmett Cohen, Christian McBride, Bill Charlotte, and many others. Barry Harris was a mentor of hers, Mm. and her grandparents were musicians as well, and her dad is a big-time gospel composer. So... You're going to see Samara or Samara Joy quite a bit, and she's just hitting the scene pretty much in the last couple of years, and it's great to see her on this track, on this album. And I love her vocals. And the way this starts, um, it starts right away with the melody. I love how there's no intro. You don't have to always have an introduction, you know, the melody, solos, then an outro. Um, You can arrange it in a lot of different ways, and here they just start with that head where you get, samara joy's vocals right away you know what she is about behind her lynn carrington terry lynn carrington is using brushes and we're we're getting a ballad here there's some nice soft touches from the keys and guitar easy going but continually driving lines from the bass and it starts to groove a little harder as it goes on at 104 there's more cymbals being used and i just love samara joy's style there's nice dynamics. There's really good full vibrato. I love what she does at 110 to 115 with, you know, holding out longer notes with nice effortless vocal movement. And at 142, listen for how she goes from down deep in the lower register of her range and how she's vocally moving elegantly upward into a higher held out note with vibrato. Overall, she's got great dynamics, great feel, superb style. And I love everything that is coming from Samara Joy. Yeah, I love they get straight to the point, like Max says. The um it's very rubato, which kind of lends to the emotion of the melody, which is nice. That run at 110, it kind of caught me by surprise, and it's it's killer that run there. And yeah, I think that the band's just doing a great job of of accompanying Samara here, and it's just very tasteful, as is a lot of stuff on this album is very done in very good taste. So I I, I definitely like that. Um, I think Ravi does a great job playing in a way that complements um Samara um on the melody. I'm getting into his, I'm gonna get into a solo a little bit here. Um, 
So yeah, on solo, I think he just plays in a way that complements Samara super well. Um, it kind of feels like he's taking the melody and kind of running with it into a solo. And he kind of reminds me of Hank Mobley in a way here, not necessarily in what he's playing, but his approach and his sound. Um, his sound is very easygoing, yet it's very commanding and very powerful. He's keeping your attention, and that very much reminds me of Hank Mobley, a very easygoing sound, but still very commanding and powerful. Um, and then on the head out, uh, I really love the dynamics and the vibrato from Samara on the head out. And there's some really cool runs over the the last few chords there at the end. It's a very nice ending. I would have vamped it out a little bit longer and let Samara or Samara Joy, please forgive me if I'm mis- mispronouncing it. Um, but if you would let Samara and, and Ravi Coltrane go back and forth a little bit and maybe do some call and response, you don't want to overdo it. But I felt as if it was a missed opportunity here with the ending. Another moment where the ending is not as satisfi- as fa- sa- geez, not as satisfactory <laughs> as the rest of the tune. Um, and overall, I am getting a lot of enjoyment from this track, more than some of the others. And I'm not exactly sure why. I think really it's just Samara Joy's style. And her vocals are just a little bit more dynamic than I think Somi somi's are and uh forgive me the other woman melanie charles i think her name was um i just i'm just getting more from samara joy on this and and i just really dig this track called two hearts um and and everything ravi coltrane is doing is very nice too and i just want to mention i i think you're onto something with the hank mobley comparison I love how he's confident and intentional, but he's not overbearing and everything he's doing is purposeful. It's saying, here I am, I'm present, but I'm not, you know, overstepping anyone's bounds. We're on this musical journey together. And I love how he comes in confidently, but it's not too much. It's not too light or wispy or loose like an Emmanuel Wilkins would do. Sorry, I had to say it. It was on my mind. Um, (laughs) I just, I just think Ravi Coltrane is, is, is so musical in this moment, and it's just a great track all in all. Yeah, I think one thing, I think it's the kind of combination of Ravi and uh, Samara Joy on this one is really what makes this track. They really stand out, and they complement each other so well. Like Max was saying, Samara's uh, um, interpretation of the song and her treatment of it and her dynamics and her ability – coupled with Robbie, you know, and his solo on this. I think, yeah, that's a um, what kind of makes this song stand out to me. Cool. Let's get into the ninth track on the album entitled Unchanged, Max. Yeah, this tune written by Marta Sanchez, a pianist and composer born and raised in Madrid, Spain, who studied classical at a conservatory there, then studied jazz and was awarded, awarded many top prizes at multiple Spanish jazz competitions, Marta Sanchez toured at many jazz festivals and moved to New York to complete a master's in music at New York University. She leads a band in New York and has recorded a series of albums with her own quintet and continues to perform throughout the New York area. So this one from uh, a a pianist and composer called Unchanged. Um, The solo trumpet actually starts this track, and it sounds like the start of a melody, and then the band comes in behind them. And there's interesting fills from the piano. Also, we get more stabbing movement again, and it's a little more dissonant. And here I'm getting, I'm being poked in the back again. I don't understand, (laughs) (laughs) Uh, but it's happening again. And there's a nice open feel as they continue. And the trumpet starts to solo. And then the guitar kind of solos and plays, (coughs) excuse me, rhythmically off of what, um, Nicholas Payton is doing. Yeah, I'll, I'll go. Yeah, I think um, that <laughs> Max is dying over here. <laughs> dying over here. Um, yeah, it's like kind of almost like counterpoints rhythmically from uh, the guitar to what Nicholas Payton is doing. Um, and then they use the melody to interlude the trumpet solo and a bass solo. Um, and one thing about the bass solo is I like what's going on in the bass solo, but it's not super far forward in the mix, and it feels like it's kind of still in the background of what's going on um with the rhythm section which kind of like i want to hear the bass solo what's going on this has happened a few times on other albums where it's like i need i want the bass solo to be forward in the mix like that's what i want to hear the most 
Um, and then we get a piano solo. And I think there was one other short piano solo on this um, that we talked about. But this feels like it's the first piano solo on the album. How did it take us this long to get like an actual full piano solo on the album? I mean, I guess we, I think we had one before, but it just feels like we've not had much piano solo, which I guess since I'm a keyboard player, like I'm going to notice that, but it just seems weird to have an album that's modern jazz music and we're on song nine and we're like, huh, there's not been a lot of piano here. So uh, what's going on? There's definitely been more guitar uh, present and featured on most of the tracks than piano but it, it seemed like until this point piano is just sort of you know laying the foundation doing short um interactions with different players you know adding a little here and there which is great because that's the color and that's what you texture know, adds, yeah. adds texture and another yeah. effect but here you're right. It's just, this is kind of the first real piano feature we've gotten on the album, and we're almost done with the album. So yeah, I just is, thought that was. I was like, man. I was like, you know what? I haven't noticed as much piano. And I was like, this is song nine. So that just kind of that kind of stood out to me there on this one. I also love what Carrington is doing on the drums behind the piano solo. There's some nice interplay and she, with, with between the two instruments, and she just adds a lot to what's going on as well so the trumpet and guitar also come back in after that playing a melody off of each other here and then it ends with guitar and trumpet holding out a lingering note and again they just love these lingering note endings on these tracks that don't seem to do as much as maybe they originally intended or they didn't think think it through enough or they didn't care or give it as much of attention as I would in the studio. No offense, but it kind of seems like the elementary way to end a lot of these tracks. I mean, it's like the most typical way that you would think to end a song, Um, which is no like and it's weird. It just it's weird because that's not the rest of this album. The rest of the album is super well thought out, very tasteful. So it just feels weird that we get to the end of songs and we're just like, all right, how do we end it? Let's end it in the most, you know, like common elementary way possible. Um, Yeah. Yeah. They love her, you know going in and out of fields and doing a lot of cool intros, but why not also do a few more cool outros? I don't know. Yeah. Like the, the respected destroyer. I was like, man, I was like, this is so cool. But that's like one out of nine times that we've gotten something like that. Um, are you ready to move on to, to, uh, Ima or Ima, the uh, 10 track on the album, Max? Let's do it. Yeah. Ima or Ima is, uh, a tune written by clarinetist and band leader on Anat, Anat Cohen born in 1975 in Tel Aviv, Israel. She began playing clarinet and sax early on and when, then went on to study at Berkeley in 1996. She's also related to siblings, trumpeter Avishai Cohen, not to be confused with the bassist of the same name. <laughs> so there's, yeah, you'll see Avishai Cohen's name in a lot of places, but you got to keep track of if it's the trumpet player or the bass player. That's like not even a common name. Well, uh, it's Israeli, you know, it's Jewish. Yeah. It's, um, you'll see it, but yeah, Avishai, you gotta be careful. The trumpet player is related to Anak Cohen and she has another brother, Yuval Cohen or Yuval Cohen. That's also a saxophone player. And in 2007, she won clarinetist of the year from the jazz journalists association and has been featured at numerous jazz festivals is also Grammy nominated and performs quite often as a leader yet has also worked with cats like Fred Hirsch as a uh, side woman as well. So you'll see Anak Cohen quite a bit in, you know, a lot of jazz festival context or, you know, touring throughout the nation. Um, so she's a big influence on the scene. And on this track, we get Julian Lodge on uh, guitar and Miss Santos again on this one. It begins with guitar and here there is definitely that Brazilian or Spanish flamenco sort of influence there. I think you were getting at earlier where it comes out more evident and it's just slapping you in the face on this track. Did you hear that? What did you think about it? Yeah, it's definitely, it feels very flamenco, like um, like finger picking, um, Spanish flamenco influence there. I definitely got it in um, a very big way on this track. Overall, it's a slower ballad tempo, too, and there's some nice brushwork on the drums by Terry Lynn Carrington and some light touches from the piano as well. Overall, it's a very mellow feel and intention, 
It sounds like a bass clarinet comes in at 140. Mm-hmm. And I really dig that sound. It fits really well with everything that's going on, but I'm not sure who's playing it. I'm guessing Ravi Coltrane, but I don't know. I would imagine he's the only like woodwind player we've had on the album. Oh, Elena Penderhues. Could be Elena. I mean, but she's I, not a reed instrument, a reed instrumentalist. I mean, she probably can yeah. be. I would imagine it's Ravi. He's the only reeded instrumentalist that we've had. That would make the I, most sense. I think you're right. And and there's longer tones or half notes sort of goose eggs with nice dynamics behind the melody that's played the by the guitar. And this goes on for quite a while. Um, and it just sorts it just seems to sort of linger on. Mm-hmm. And there's not too much development there. It sounds kind of like a release of tension at three oh eight or so. And then we get some more improvisation from the guitar. There's some nice layering from other instruments. The piano is sort of floating on top for a sec. And then the flute is then floating on top. And there's an overall slight build in dynamics and intensity, but it's very slow moving. And then the flute takes the reins again at the very end with the trumpet doubling what Elena is doing. And then we hear again a lingering long note and cymbal ringing or piano pedal to end it. Yeah. It's just, yeah, it's this track, It you mentioned kind of like a beach earlier. This kind of sets a very, it's a relaxed tempo. I wouldn't call this a ballad, but it is a ballad tempo. Um, So right. very relaxed tempo. And it kind of sets a scene in my head of something very serene. A beach or a sunset is like kind of what comes to mind. And yeah, jazz bass clarinet. I love this. And I think it fits the timbre of the, the song really well. But it's so short lived. Like, let's. I actually wanted some more of this. Um, but yeah, and then we get a, a decently long guitar solo, and it's in that kind of flamenco fusion kind of style. Um, but yeah, this song to me, it just it feels to not really go anywhere. But it has like really nice sonic appeal. Like, it sounds really nice to me. Like, I like the sound here. It just feels like it doesn't go anywhere. And so I just I, w- I there could have been more done. I like what I like what's going on. I like how it sounds. I just I want more from it. I think you're spot on with that critique. And I would have liked a bass clarinet solo. Yeah, um, yeah, for sure. Because that's not you know solely atypical in jazz. There's the great Eric Dolphy. Mm-hmm. Um, a lot of times in big band arrangements, you'll have the Barry Sax player on bass clarinet for certain charts. Um, when you make the sax section double on a different instrument, sometimes you want that timbre and overall texture to a, to a certain big band arrangement. So you'll, you'll see it every once in a while. It's not completely uncommon, but here it was unexpected and it was a good surprise. I just think they could have, you know, taken more advantage of that bass clarinet in this track. Yeah. Yeah. I thought that it, it sounded super cool. So let's like, why not explore it a little bit more? I definitely agree there. Um, one random thing is I also realized I had no clue. I had been spelling timbre wrong for my, my entire life. I wrote it. I wrote T A M B O R and I tried to Google to make sure. And I was like, huh? I was like, oh, and I, I've seen the word timbre written out and I was like, ha, that's how you spell it. So like Max Which, has misspelled symbols a million times. I've been misspelling timbre every time I've written it. But now I'm, now I'm I'm correct in the way I'm spelling it. So T-I-M-B-R-E, timbre. That's right. So when you saw it spelled out, did you think the word was timbre? Or no, what? dude. I knew <laughs> that that was timbre. Was... But then when I would spell it, I would just spell it my own way. But I knew that that was timbre. I don't know what is wrong with me. I I was like typing it out and I typed Tamra. I was like, that is that how you spell it? I was like, is there a U? <laughs> and I Googled it and I was like, no, it's with an I. Like I I I there's some there's come kind of, it's like Max spells symbols with an S uh, all the time in the the notes and I I don't point well, it out sometimes, but I I feel like I should. It so is I'll not call all my, the time. I'll call myself out. It, it's been at least twice. <laughs> twice is not all the time (laughs) yeah i'm just messing with you max i I think it's gotten better so we're learning how to spell on the jazz jam podcast and eventually we'll we'll be good at it that's true there are a lot of musical terms and we hear them all the time but we don't always write them like i'm not always writing these things out. i'll talk about timbre but i'm not always writing it you know in a an outline so that's right yeah we're doing our best here and <laughs> our faults come out occasionally and that was one i'll of them. point my own faults out i was like man i was like i've 
apparently just don't know how to spell timbre. So cool. Yep. That's that's really all I have. Yeah, the the ending again doesn't do much for me there. That's yeah, I really like how the song sounds, but kind of fails yep. fails me in a few ways. And then another personal disappointment on this album is the next track mm. rounds and just not ne- I there's some great moments in this tune rounds. It's a free jazz composition. I just meant we're ending a modern jazz album again with a free jazz composition and I don't understand that practice. That has been coming up quite a bit we talked about it with the emmanuel Wilkins seventh hand album but i've also seen that a few other times i i'm a little lost at why we keep doing this yeah i feel we probably have a sour taste in our hands at, or in our mouth after um a 35 minute of a uh, lift or whatever the, <laughs> that track is on emmanuel wilkins album so we're probably semi-traumatized from having to listen to that um no offense to that album there are some really cool things on that album but that you know really so yeah i love this is actually this is my favorite free jazz composition that we've listened to on the podcast but i don't like that it's the last song on the album it's i don't feel like that's the place for it i feel like i want i want closure and i want resolution and that's something that this track doesn't do let's talk about the track itself and then we can kind of keep getting into to you know that yeah this is Right. This is called Rounds, written by Marilyn Crispell, or Crispell, I'm not sure, spelled C-R-I-S-P-E-L-L, a pianist and composer born in Philly in 1947. Marilyn began attending the Peabody Conservatory at age seven, studying classical piano, and was also improvising at an early age, but generally in a classical setting or, or format. Um, she graduated in 68 from the New England Conservatory, began being interested in jazz in 1975 after hearing Coltrane's album, A Love Supreme. She studied with Charles Bonacus in Boston and transcribed a whole bunch, soon became acquainted with cats like Cecil Taylor and Don Cherry, started playing with Anthony Braxton, and later worked with Reggie Workman, Henry Grimes, Gary Peacock, and currently performs extensively, both as a soloist and as a leader, and is known for her work in conducting workshops and education in free improvisation all throughout the country. This also features a guest trumpet player, Ambrose Akinmusire, or is it Akinmusire? How do you pronounce uh, that? Akinmusiri. Oh, yeah. I didn't even know that. <laughs> Ambrose Akinmusiri, born yep. in 1982 in Oakland, California, member of the Berkeley High School Jazz Ensemble. Ambrose was mentored by saxophonist Steve Coleman. He studied at Manhattan School of Music and then got a master's at USC, Southern California, after winning the Thelonious Monk International Jazz Competition, where he soon began working with cats like Aaron Parks, Esperanza Spalding, Jason Moran, and then he made a record on Blue Note in 2011 and has since recorded and performed with a host of musicians and has been also Grammy-nominated and is a very active player on the scene today. This track kind of begins with Ambrose and the keys and the bass enters and shortly after the drums enter. So there's a nice layering going on with rounds that I I really dig that is just complementary musically to the introduction. The piano is kind of sporadic and then there's some space and the trumpet takes over a bit with some insertions from the rhythm section, the bass and the drums at different times. It seems a little random. And we're just kind of, again, slapped in the face with free jazz right away. And as there is movement, though, we get kind of heavier and more bass plucking and some fast sort of short plucking from the piano. I do like the drums on this track so far. At this point, there's really nice use of cymbals, and I spelled cymbals the correct way with the C. (laughs) (laughs) Also, some nice playing on the snare from Terry Lynn Carrington. I... In general, I don't think the bass is adding that much, but other instruments are very developing, very um, developmental in what they're playing. There's some also nice wasp like playing from trumpet on here. The piano is moving with more chords, and there's almost a groove happening in the drums right at 330 to 345. And then there's some heavier banging going on at the four minute mark. There's some cool stuff from the trumpet. It sounds like he's messing with pedal tones a little bit. 
Um, there's a lot going on all in all. What did you think of the trumpet on this track? And, and what would you point out in the first four or five minutes? Yeah. So I do like the way that they layer in. It feels it's pretty random, but it feels like they're kind of following Ambrose on this track. Um, they're, it seems like they're just kind of falling along with what he's doing, which is cool. They're listening. Um, there's some cool rhythm section accompanying behind the trumpet solo. It's free, but still communicative. And it just goes to show, even when you're playing in like a more free jazz kind of setting, you're not just playing in your own kind of vacuum bubble. You're still playing in a group setting, even though it's more loose and open. It's not just ever playing like you. It's not like you just walk into a practice room. People are just playing different things like you're still playing together. You still should be communicating. Um, And yeah, there's some nice dynamic build. There's not a whole lot of tonal centeredness to it. Um, but Ambrose is, is killing on this track, and I kind of wish that we had heard some Ambrose um, prior on maybe a more straight-ahead tune, but he, I do like what he's playing here um, on this track. There's definitely there's some cool getting into like a little bit past that five-minute mark that you talked about, cool percussion stuff that we start to get at 510, and then some really cool growls and uh, techniques from Ambrose during this section. Did you hear those, those growls and things that he was doing? I did. I love the... I don't know, sort of all the things Ambrose is, is using in his trumpet playing. He's doing a lot of different things, but at the right times. And that's a very, I don't know, key thing to think about when you're listening to what Ambrose is doing on the trumpet on this track. It's It, it, it seems at first random and, you know, free jazz, whatever happens, happens. But there are key moments when you hear in his playing, you know, specifically what he's doing how he's playing it that there's a there's an intention behind when he's doing it as well and so that just creates a a sense of development and what the trumpet player is doing and then there's a really cool moment at 545 where the piano player plays a a motive or a motif and the bass player follows what the piano player is doing what do you know they're listening and developing together and this is a moment where this this is a prime example of what Emmanuel Wilkins was missing on his free jazz composition lift at the end of the seventh hand album. Here is is what I think could have added so much to what Wilkins wanted to do on his album. And here they do it, where you're, they're listening to each other and they're going where somebody else goes and exploring all the things that another player is doing. And it just creates a cohesiveness in terms of the interaction of the music that they're playing with one another. And I also love how Terry Lynn Carrington accents on the drums, what the piano is doing and the trumpet is filling in spaces sometimes and being very intentional with what he's doing. And so they're listening to each other and developing in, I think the way free jazz intends to occur. Yeah, I definitely can agree with that sentiment. It feels like at one point there's like a kind of groove, a semblance of like a groove or a melody that's like coming, but then it never actually happens. And I think that's cool. Like kind of give us something, give us something that keep us interested, you know? And so I think there's lots of moments throughout this song that does that, that there's some really cool stuff going on and some interplay and things going on. Um, yeah, like I said, this has been one of my favorite kind of more free jazz composition songs that we've done but I really question why it's the last track on the album and not something with some more closure or like resolution to it. Absolutely. It's not my favorite, but I've definitely heard it done worse (laughs) and there's enough cool moments and rounds to, you know, appreciate musically what's going on. And there is a little bit of a swing section right around 655. Carrington starts to actually swing on the drum set and the band starts to move a little bit like they're starting an actual tune, which is what you were getting at. And there are some dynamics downward by the seventh minute, and we get some simultaneous melodic playing from the trumpet and the bass where there is a melody. So I think the last few minutes are really cool in in what they're adding to it musically. Again, you're right. It's, it, it's a very questionable circumstance having it to end the album because it doesn't seem to fit as well with everything else that's going on with the other tracks on the record. Yeah. 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 I, yeah. I don't think it's a bad 
thing in the record, but just doing it last. I don't know. Yeah, it it's questionable to me, in my opinion. Um, I mean, some people might love it being last, but well, let's get into our top three and our not so ha- uh, hot tracks now that we've gone through all the the tracks on the album. Max, why don't you go ahead and uh, hit us with your top three and your hot, not so hot track first? My number one is the tune "Circling," which was the Gretchen Parlato tune. There's a lot going on. I love the groove. I love what Michael Mayo is doing and how the instruments interact with one another. My number two is two hearts in parentheses lawns, um, AKA lawns. And that one is with Samara joy. I just think it's very dynamic. I love the ballad feel overall. It's just really nice. Number three is Windflower, which was the first track on the album. I think it's, it's a, it's a superb representation of what their overall intention is with this album. There's a lot of cool solos. Um, it's got a female composer that may not be as well known as they should be. And so I think starting with one flower is a great idea. And I've heard that tune played a number of times from different players. So I'm a little more fam- familiar with that one than some of the other ones on the album. So I, I love that one. And that one's my number three. My not so hot was Ima or Ima. Um, because of how short it is and how little development goes on. I'm a little bewildered as to why there wasn't more attention given to the ending and why not do more with the bass clarinet when you have it. Um, It just seems unfinished to me. Yeah, I definitely can agree with those sentiments on Ema. Um, I don't think Ema is even a short track, though. It's like five and a half minutes long. Oh, I think you're right. It is longer, but to me it seemed... It just doesn't just, develop a whole lot. But I just wanted to clarify that. Like, it's not even... You're right. There's just you're not... Right. There's, you know, the guitar solo is pretty long, which kind of is what gives it most of, most of the length. Um, all right. Well, I'm going to get into my uh, my top three and my not so hot. Um, for the second week in a row, um, one of my top tracks is one that Max has completely omitted from his top three. Um, I have number one. I have Respected Destroyer. I just think that it's a really cool um, kind of way of fusing some different, more modern musical ideas with a kind of a rock groove into jazz music. And I just really like um, the solos on Respected Destroyer. I think Elena's flute solo is just awesome. And I think that the trumpet solo is just, you know, we kind of talked about it, about it's you don't have to play a bunch of notes to be musical. I think the trumpet solo is super musical. Um, so yeah, I just I love the composition. I love the fusion aspect of the song, and I don't. It just speaks to me. Um, I agree. Circling is a, a great track. Um, it's one of the the vocal tunes on the album. Um, it's the one sung by uh, Michael Mayo, I believe. Right. Yep. 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 It's Michael um, Mayo. Yep. And oh, oh yeah, I love let me get up to my notes. I want to make sure. Yeah. Oh yeah, I love um uh Julian Lage's solo on that one. So really cool there. Um then they kind of the composition is cool with going back to the trumpet solo after the melody. Yeah, I thought that tra- track just uh had a lot going on and the melody is super cool. The singing is great on it. And then my third track on my top three is uh Two Hearts uh lawns i think that track is just um super well done uh let's see yeah this is the one with samara joy on it i think samara joy this track we kind of talked about it samara joy and robbie coltrane that kind of dynamic duo just it deserves to be in the top three the the col the coltrane solo is incredible samara joy singing is awesome it definitely deserves a spot in the top three um so kind of all of my top threes there's kind of just some cool solos going on and i think the solos that stand out the most to me on the album um the reason why i did not have respected destroyer on my list is because i am over the jazz rock i think it's mm. overdone it doesn't it didn't i you know i i could take it or leave it i mean overall it's a great composition and a great treatment of it and there's some awesome playing going on and i do think that is the most listened to track from this album Hmm. on spotify 
And I believe I did hear the Real Jazz Sirius XM channel play Respected Destroyer from this album in the car the other day. Um, so it is one that they're playing on the radio, and it is overall very accessible, I think, to a listener audience. I am just a little over some of the basic fundamental um, fusion type aspects to a song like that. Yeah, Max, a little old school Kansas City. So. <laughs> Just kidding. Um, no, I, I can see that. I just, yeah, I think it's, uh, for what it is, I think it's it's well done. I think one track that I want to put as my honorable mention um, is Uplifted Heart. We kind of talked a lot about that track. I think it's just super interesting what's going on, and I think it's uh, well done for what it is. I think um, that's definitely an honorable mention in my book. My honorable mention would be Throw It Away or Throwing It Away with the two vocalists mm-hmm. on the same track and how they interact, and I just, I, I love overall the effect of of that song and that would be my personal honorable mention and then my number five would be respected destroyer okay all right i can i can uh i can get in with that um (laughs) cool well let's get into our so yeah we kind of have different top threes again this this week um which is cool we kind of have some different things that are speaking to us and there's a lot on this album and uh we'll kind of get into how it's kind of well-rounded so there can be some different things it's not obvious what the top three is um, I'll go ahead and get into my overall thoughts as well as my album rating for this one. One second. Did you say what your not so hot was? Oh, oh, no, no, no. Good point. My not so hot is unchanged. Um, there just wasn't really much going on in this track. It just it is the one that just stood out to me the, the least. I can like barely like all the other tracks. I can remember them pretty well. I was trying to remember this track and I went and listened to it and I was like, yeah, this is, yeah, there's a reason that I didn't remember this. So to me, it's just not super memorable. There's a reason why it's called unchanged. Yeah. It's going <laughs> to stay in my not so much. hot. It's unchanged. Um, <laughs> All right, but yeah, on. so that's my, my not so hot. Um, yeah. I, Max's pick Ema. I, that almost was mine, but I thought there was something there. So like there could be something there. I just, I agree. It didn't go anywhere. Um, but well, there's, there's, there's something great, there. Yeah. There's great guitar going on in, in Ema and it's a great overall feel and texture. I think yeah. I just wanted more. And I, I guess I, for what it gave me, I wanted it to be shorter. So I think that's why I, I said it was shorter because in my head it was too short in terms of development mm-hmm. and what you could do with that song, even yeah. though it goes on for five or six minutes. Yeah. Um, that's what I was trying to, portray yeah no i can i can feel that all right cool i'm gonna get into my overall thoughts um and my rating um carrington gives us a, a vast range of musical ideas with this project and features some of the most prominent contemporary female composers as well as bright young jazz musicians this album showcases its well-rounded nature going from african to latin styles contemporary compositions such as respected destroyer to vocal ballads and many places in between The level of musicianship is high and the arranging is effortless and seamless. This album feels like a modern compilation of many of the places the music can take us. Elena Penderhughes really shines to me as she often does. Um, She provides thoughtful and ever grooving solos and the rhythm section led by uh, Terry Lynn Carrington seems to be always on the same page. Um, There could be more elements of bop or swing present to add to the level of versatility on this album um, and really demonstrate the root, uh, the roots of the music. I think I don't quite understand the decision to end the album on a free jazz number and not something with more resolution and closer uh, closure, but that kind of seems to be a modern trend. We've heard it a few times. There isn't a lot of stretching going on, but it doesn't feel like it's, needed given the compositions and the theme of the album um it's more about highlighting the compositions and shining a light on female composers which is a promise that is uh well delivered on in my opinion and so for that reason um i think this album is very solid it's very well rounded and my score is an 8.1 out of 10 yeah i think there's some great points there i would also say um just i'll reiterate some of those points in general, I think this album is, is overall pretty good. Terry Lynn Carrington is an active performer. She's one of the drum set players on the scene today. She is associated with the likes of Christian McBride and the Berkeley College of Music, 
well known for being a pioneer amongst women jazz musicians. Her activism leads her into directions that others may not take. And I think New Standards Volume 1 is a prime example. All songs on the album are written by women. And this cast of musical characters includes a large number of women as well. Musically, there are a number of things to like about the album, from the use of different meters, nice melodies, odes to African music, a lot of vocal, sorry, vocal features, and the inclusion of some nice bass and saxophone solos. Trumpeter Nicholas Payton and flute extraordinaire Elena Pender Hughes are well featured, in addition to some nice accompaniment and solos from guitarists Matt Stevens and Julian Lodge. New vocal sensation Samara Joy shines on two hearts. In general, the vast array of guest artists is a neat aspect to the album, aiding and providing another dimension to the music. There are certain moments that don't speak out to me personally, yet every track is well executed. The seeming trend and tendency to end a modern jazz album with a free jazz number is solidified through this album's last track called Rounds, featuring the outstylings of Ambrose Ekinmusar. That tune has some nice moments, but I am not sure as to how much this composition adds to the overall album. Almost all tunes seem to end practically the same way as well, giving way to questions concerning certain arranging decisions. A tad more verbatim swing feel rhythm would be nice too. Other than that, there are a huge number of nice musical interactions between instruments, and everyone is working together to accomplish the task at hand. I thoroughly enjoy a lot of this music, yet for some other moments, I could take it or leave it. My overall score is a 7.9 out of 10. Yeah, and so that puts us in the, um, our combined score is going to be an 8 out of 10. I think it's that's a very good score. I think this album has a lot of cool elements to it. Um, yeah, and so it's definitely one that I recommend checking out. There's some cool stuff going on. Uh, it's, it's really recently released, so if you're looking for something new to check out, definitely give it a listen, and there's some, some cool things to listen for. Cool. Um, well, let's get into... Uh, before we close out the episode, we're going to talk about next week's album and then um, talk about where you can find all of our content. So, first of all, before we get into next week's album, I just want to say the best way to um, interact with us, the best place to find everything is just on our website. Uh, it's linked in the show notes below. Everything We have a, a Spotify playlist with our top threes from every album. We have our power rankings of all the albums we've done kind of a list a master list of the rankings of our um, ratings for every album which is cool there's artist page where you can get a little bio into every artist we've done each album each episode has its own page with our overall thoughts and ratings our email our instagram everything's on our website so it's a great place to go if you're just looking for um, some thoughts on some jazz music and some different things to check out. And you can contact us uh, on there as well. So definitely go check out our website. It's in the show notes below. Um, and let us know what you think about that. But so our next episode, next week's album is going to be by saxophonist Ike Quebec. It's blue and sentimental. Um, recorded in 1961 record or released in 1963 i think that's actually the same as night train which we did um our last classic album was recorded in 61 released in 63 which is kind of interesting um blue note record there's some bonus tracks uh i think max wants to get into those as well so i'm super excited for that one max this is max's pick max uh you looking forward to doing some Quebec? kind of an underrated under known um saxophonist from some people that's right and that's more or less why I picked it. You know, when you think about picking the next classic album to review, there's so many directions you could go, so many people that come into your mind. But I wanted to pick somebody that some people may not recognize their name. But Ike, Ike Quebec was a saxophone player. He worked in the office. I think it was an, an A&R guy for Blue Note Records. But he has four great albums on Blue Note. And this is one of them called Blue and Sentimental. Um, another one is called It Might As Well Be Spring. Another one is Heavy Soul, which mm -hmm. might be my personal favorite mm -hmm. of his. And there's one more called Soul Samba or Bassa Samba. 
um, which is all sort of Latin tunes. And so those are the big four from I Quebec. And so this is one of those. And I just really dig his playing. You know, some of what he does is exactly what I'm personally going for. And there's some great tracks on that album, including one original tune that we'll talk about. So I think there's a lot to discuss, a lot to sort of geek out over. And it'll be a nice sort of, I don't know, palette cleansing album to listen to and check out after some of these newer albums that we've learned that we've listened to. Yeah, kind of getting back to the the roots, which will be nice. Um, awesome. Well, I just want to thank everyone for listening to this episode, our review, our critique, our thoughts about New Standards Volume 1 by Terry Lynn Carrington. We look forward to uh, um, talking to you on our next episode. And for Max Levy, I am Dwayne Gunnels, and this has been an episode of the Jazz Jam Podcast. Mm-hmm.